What's up, ecosystem? Welcome back to Auto Transport Intel, the car shipping business channel. Tonight's show is all about new vehicle shipping by rail. Uh, what types of auto rack trailers, volume of vehicles shipped by rail, the number of rail cars on a full auto train, OEM rail car shipping, rail yard truck unloading. Rails don't go to the dealer. Buckloader ramps, bridge plates, geobaying, asset tracking, when to use rail versus truck. We also have information about standard operating procedures, what a driver needs to double check before loading. Our expert consultants tonight include Jeff Grandstaff, Gold Star Resources, Peter Daly of Daly and Associates, and a special thanks to Lisa Hanmer of Transport Perspectives, LLC. Thanks, Lisa. Please join the live chat. Ask your questions, share your thoughts, grow your business, because it's Tuesday Nights Live on Auto Transport Intel. I'm Jay, your host. Welcome back to the show. Thank you guys so much for joining me to again, again on a Tuesday night. It's Tuesday Nights Live. We are live, and I want you to feel welcome. Listen, if this is your first time here, please do feel welcome. This is an open forum, and you can share the information, whatever. If you got a question, if you got something to say, promote your business, tell us about your services, phone number, email, website. Put it in the live chat, because in a few minutes, we're going to go into the live chat. We are a community, and we're growing, and we want to meet you. We want to talk to you. We want to help you. At the quarter hour, we've got industry news. That's national news, social media news, front of the store, back of the store, what's being talked about, auto transport tech, car shipping trends, vehicle logistics news, EV. It's in the news. After that long segment, it's worth it. We're going to go at the 40-minute mark into the new vehicle shipping by rail expert consultants panel with Jeff Grandstaff, Peter Daly, Lisa Hanmer. This is going to be great. If, you, if there's something you don't know, feel free to ask a question. If you got something to add, put it in the live chat. That's wonderful. Do that. And then stick around because then we're going to have a panel discussion. We're going to bring in Ty, Alex... Robbie, and we're going to add to whatever consultants we can hang on to, we'll take them. And we're going to go into the discussion, open it up, and talk about, you know, in general trucking, because the first part really is more of a presentation style information session. It really, it's going to be great. Um, and you know what's neat about like a show like this is that uh, this, the impetus of the show, this started in last year. I think it was December. Maybe I talked to Lisa. I can't remember, Lisa. Do you remember? Maybe we'll talk about that. Oh, also, hey, do me a favor. After you hit that like button, and thank you, thank you for doing that, uh, please do look below the video. You see that share button, and then you click share, you click copy, and you can grab that YouTube link when you hit copy. Take that YouTube link, text it, email it, share it on social media. 
Facebook, Instagram, there are car shippers everywhere, whether they're folks that want to be drivers, want to be brokers, maybe you're helping a dealer, maybe there's an OEM, maybe you know a guy at an OEM right now that's dying for a show like this and just doesn't know where to find it. Well, we're here, so let him know. We're going to be live, and he's got time. He or she has time to join the show. Also, go to autotransportintel.com. You don't know where to start. Sign up as an ATI Insider, and you will talk to Ty. He'll tell you what's going on, get some reference, get some information, welcome you to the community. We'll put you on the email blast list. It's going to be great. So I'll tell you what, here's what we're going to do right after this we are going to go into the live chat. Stick around. Have you signed up for Holly? Go to holly.com, H-A-U-L-L-Y.com. For our podcast listeners, go to Holly. It's powered by United Road. It's a load board. They've got technology that want to help you stay loaded. Also find out about the NVTA, National Vehicle Transporters Alliance. Go to nvta.org. So go nvta.org. Go there. Let's go into the live chat. Let's say hello. Okay, I see that. Yeah, Jeff, you know what? Do you, do you know how to ring the cowbell? And by the way, new rule. You got to make it in the live chat to ring the cowbell because I don't want, or we could do it in the panel, but I can't do it during the interview. Okay, so new, new rule. And thank you for tuning in. Now, I'm going to back this up to the top. Um, this is where I get my car shipping business intel. That's what Ty says. See, look at that. There it is. Thank you, Ty. That is how you ring the cowbell. Thank you so much, Ty. Thank you, buddy. Uh, the contributions to this channel. And man, hey, good job, Ty. Do you see that show on Friday? Holy cow. Ty was live at America's Auto Auction and, in Kansas City, and... We had Jason and Joel of Black Widow Imaging live from St. Louis, all connecting. There we had Jennifer at America's Auto Auction asking questions of Black Widow Imaging live on a Friday afternoon on Auto Transport Intel. Wow. Wow is all I can say. Jeff and Faith and Freedom! Thank you so much, Jeff. I thank you so much. Appreciate it. You know, Jeff, um, I've been wearing your t-shirt. Um, great, great shirt. Been wearing that. Thinking about you. Hope you're doing well. And um, tuning in from Florida. Jeff is an early uh, community member here at Auto Transport Intel. And see, that's what it's all about. Uh, by the way, mic check. I think we're okay. Mic check one, two, three. Is this how to do it? That is how to do it. Nice job. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's keep going. I'm going to go back to the top. Um, Seaport Services in here. Excuse me, is this where I find the car? Shipping Therapist. It's an interesting question. It is. Maybe. Are you the car shipping therapist? Is there somebody else in here that is your therapist? Uh, Carlos Braxton, ACB Logistics is here. What's up, Carlos? Part of the core. Thanks, buddy. John G. Part of the core. What's up? Mark Grodeke. Part of the core, man. Love to see you guys in here. Joel Hawk is in here. That was an amazing show Friday. Thanks, Joel. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Kimberly's here. Hey, Kimberly. All right, with the new logo. I see. That looks really good. I really like it. Um, let's see. Young Dill, 1981. What's going on? First time. First time caller, long time listener, Chris Chamberlain. Chris Chamberlain, um, now part of the community, has been in the uh, a few of the recent roundtables. Great stuff. And also, I've seen you in, uh, I think, maybe Dispatching Live, DOT Compliance. So thanks for your contribution, participation, and saying hello. You're not required to ring the cowbell. You're not. It's just that we appreciate it, and anything you donate to the channel goes back into the channel. You know, maybe we've talked on the phone. Maybe we've had a meeting, and, you know, we didn't, we didn't sign up any advertising, but you want to give back. 
So you can do that in the super chat, and I thank you. And I just, I'm just going to keep moving on because I really do appreciate it. Nick Medor is here. I'm so glad you made it, Nick. Uh, you made industry news, so that's so cool. Richard Albritton, yo, yo, yo. What's up, Rich? Louis Beltran Sokolov, hey, what's up? Cool, man, thank you. Thanks very much. Jeff, of course. Ooh, gets the cowbell and the bell. Barry Downey is here, first time viewer. That's what it is. I'm gonna get, you know what? I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you one cow, okay. All right, I think you're getting carried away, Jay. And we try not to do that. Mac Rodeke, how long have you been on YouTube streaming? Been a while. It's been a, quite a while, man. Silver Mint is here. What's up, Silver Mint? Barton Landon, what's going on? Uh, who else we got here? Wow, this is great. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and saying hello. And, um, okay, yeah, we got, okay, more back and forth. Cool, that's so cool. And we'll get some more. Oh, Young Dill, getting ready to start my car hauling business. There we go. I've gotten a lot of good info from this channel. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. Um, and you know what you can do um, is if you have not already signed up as an ATI Insider, here's the link. Again, you're not required to do that. You don't have to do it. Man, just sit and watch the videos. And for folks that watch the videos, you don't have to say anything. You know that. You can just watch the videos. It's on YouTube. It's every week. Auto Transport Intel is live four times a week now, which is crazy. But, uh, but true. And you know, uh, that schedule could change. Uh, so that's the thing is that if you're able to make a show, enjoy it, right? It's like every day, you know, every day we have on this planet. Show up, try to enjoy it, work hard, because, you know, things change. And there'll be days that we you can't do a live show because of, of something. In fact, uh, June, in June, I'll be going back to my first trade show in over a year. Um, in June is the car conference in Las Vegas. Um, auctions, dealers, rental, fleet. It's going to be amazing. So we're going to be talking more about that. And if you have a question about that show, let me know. If you've got information to share, let me know. I signed up a few weeks ago. Fantastic. Fantastic. Used cars getting thin, but dealer trades increasing. That is interesting. Now, you know what? Thank you, Jeff. That is very interesting because it's that kind of data. Even Paul Machine today, <laughs> I sent him an email and I think he's oh, it was on the on the LinkedIn post. Paul Machine said data. I want data. Always looking for more data. Paul Machine, if you're listening, um, that is interesting data, and I'd love to see if Paul could plot a point on a graph of the trend of used car dealer trades. That'd be interesting. That would be an interesting plot point. In fact, Tim. Mike Check, what's up, Tim? Uh, Tim, what do you think of the increase in dealer trades? I'll bet you've got some input on that feedback. You know what I'm saying? Um, in fact, what do we got here? Not this Friday. Is it this Friday? Let's see. What is the date? I think it's next Friday. Yeah, next Friday is the melting block of ice with Tim and Paul. That's going to be great. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in, saying hello, joining the live chat. This is Auto Transport Intel. This is the Car Shipping Business Channel. And if you've got uh, you got an idea for a show, send me an email, autotransportintel at gmail.com. You want to meet somebody in the community, let me know how we can help. So let's do this. I'll tell you what. Let's do this. And after this, we're going to go into industry news. Stick around. Superflow Systems is excited to introduce DispatchCenter.com a full-service load board for brokers, shippers, carriers, and drivers, featuring integrations with Truckify mobile app and iTruckPay. Use Route Scout technology to build your routes. Maximize truck capacity. Stay loaded at the highest available revenue with the least amount of driving miles. Tell us your lanes. Loadification will alert you to new loads posting in your route. Views instant load notifications sent with BookNow features Search and book loads directly through the Truckify mobile app. Brokers and shippers, post your loads to Dispatch Center. Give authorized carriers the opportunity to instantly book your loads. Dispatch Center powers the Truckify mobile app, allowing instant load assignment to the driver. Truckify will send inspection reports, geolocated pickup and delivery photos, BOLs, and invoices back to the broker. 
brokers, shippers, carriers, and drivers, Dispatch Center, and Truckify have what you need to be more profitable every day. Visit DispatchCenter.com, get signed up, log in, see the new features. And Mark is in the live chat, so if you've got a question, he's right here. He's right here. In fact, Mark... Mark is ringing the cowbell. Thank you so much, Mark. I really do appreciate it. Um, and Mark really cares, and he wants to hear. If you've got something you don't like about the mobile app you're using, or there's a feature, or a button, or part of the process, mobile apps, TMS, you're a dispatcher, you're not liking your TMS, you're a carrier, you're not liking your mobile app, you're a broker, and you're not happy with your CRM, Mark is in the live chat. Superflow Systems in the house and he wants to help and he wants to know what's going on with you and the stuff you're using and he, he's got he's, he's got solutions all over the place and and hey John Cochran is here what's up John Cochran thanks for tuning in and saying hello let's go into industry news let's go ahead and do that it is time for industry news it is the quarter hour after the eight and this is the new vehicle shipping by rail show again mic check one two three let's get a little more check one two check check okay uh new vehicle shipping by rail show 186 in a row on a tuesday night wow that's amazing first rail shipping show we've done we have not done a show dedicated to rail shipping and it's a it's important it's a big deal it's a big part of auto transport Thank you, Nick Medor, MBS Canada. Um, there you can see there is the auto rack trailer car coming off. This would be a tri-level. We're going to be talking all about that. Have you spotted a auto rack trailer? Have you seen any? Send me a photo. Let me know what you see. Let me know what you think. How many cars were on it? There's your truck. The GM has been using geofencing technology. Loading the truck. That's going to be a buy level because there's not room for three trucks in one of those. And we know this. We're going to get so much information. This is Jeff Grandstaff of Gold Star Resources. He is here with us tonight. Be sure to ask him about all that he can help you with. If you've got questions, if you're an OEM, if you're a dealer, if you're an auction, this is Peter Daly. Peter Daly is going to be with us tonight. Thank you so much, Peter Daly. Daly and Associates. That's his business. And Lisa Hanmer. Thank you so much, Lisa, for helping put this show together. Lisa is with us tonight. So, you know, we talk about the auto transport industry ecosystem, right? Uh, OEMs, auctions, dealers, shippers, services, brokers, carriers, equipment, re regulations, and loads. And on this show, we're going to let's do an intersection of services, carrier, equipment on behalf of loads or rather, on behalf of OEMs, auctions, dealers, and shippers, for their loads. Is that, is that, is that clear enough? Okay. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we do back of the store, front of the store, back of the store, transport, parking lot, front of the store, where they sell the cars, and around it goes. We do that because it is the year of the hybrid. Digital meets physical. Physical meets digital. I just talked to a guy. If they could figure out a way to ship a car digitally, <laughs> they would do it. But they can't. At the auction, it's a packed house. Wow. Bang. That's why Ty, it's when the auction is a packed house, Ty is on Clubhouse. How about that for a bumper sticker, Ty? Go check out Ty on the iOS platform on Clubhouse. Ty Transport Guy wants to talk to you. Whether you're a dealer, OEM, auction, people ask me all the time. Okay, so your audience is carriers? Eh, not exactly. Not anymore, really. It is auto transport business professionals. Dealers, auctions, OEMs, carriers, brokers, dispatchers. Don't go robot, Jay. Not tonight. 5,000 carriers, 5,000 loads by June 5th. Go to Dispatch Center. Get signed up. Fries are up. Did somebody say chip shortage? <laughs> I knew, somebody's like, I knew this show would get hammy. Well, yeah, they did. We've been saying it. Although uh, TSMC antip anticipates the global auto component shortage will improve in the second quarter. 
Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. It'll be less severe in the second quarter. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, but that's not going to help this situation. Or this. That's why it's about time NC Lawmaker wants to stop highway drivers from hauling mattresses on vehicle roofs. Really? We need a law? <laughs> wow. The driver's like, wow. I pull into the scale, there's about a million things they're looking at. But the guy with a mattress on his roof just flies on by. They gotta write a law for this guy. That's pretty funny. Oh. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, man. That's a couch on the back. <laughs> on the way, way back. Free shipping? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, so hands-free highway driving arrives for the F-150 later this year. Oh, joy! No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's a joke. I'm just kidding, Ford. But, you know, <laughs> some super truckers thinking, really? Now there's going to be hotshot guys without their hands on the wheels? Oh, that's funny. Uh, and speaking of, if, if that's not funny, the best crossover SUVs for towing. Towing is no longer a job only for pickups. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. This guy's going to love you. Okay. That is pretty... Wow. Uh, hey, I came across... got this email. Came across pretty amazing and deep discount program. So this is mudflapinc.com. Saving them a quarter per gallon on diesel for nothing? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what you have to do. I guess you just go sign up and start saving money. It's pretty cool. Worth sharing. Mudflapinc.com. Inc, mud Send me your stuff. You got something to share? We'll share it. This is how you get your car shipping news on Auto Transport Intel. Uh, and I do want to thank the IARA. So we did this show. Check this out. Thank you, IARA. I made their recent news on their home page. And if you click it, you can go to the podcast, which is now available on Apple and Google. Auto Transport Intel Podcast. Check it out. It's pretty neat. Thank you very much. Okay, you know that? You know, okay, Jay. <laughs> Just great. Auto Transport Intel, put it up on the big screen. You can cast it. Oh, you know what time it is? So you, what you're going to do is fire up dispatchcenter.com forward slash ask Larry. Here we go. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad became the first U.S. railway chartered for commercial transport of passengers and freight in what year? Here we go. What is the most appropriate carrier pay amount to ship a 68 Chevy Biscayne from Portland, Washington to El Paso, Texas? Ooh. Making money. Right now, especially right now. And don't mess around with Larry the Llama, the Quotify Llama, because he knows what's going on. He knows what it takes to get the to get the to get the car moved. And here's what you do. Again, go to dispatchcenter.com. There's the link in the live chat. Go to dispatchcenter.com forward slash ask Larry. Submit your answers. There's five questions. You can win. Win a hat. I have two. Maybe you'll win one of mine. Tell him when he's won, Mark. Okay, here we go. In 2018, what dollar amount of motor vehicles, parts, were shipped via railroad? Dang. Wow. All right. I know it's over a million dollars. Or what? <laughs> That's a billion. It's over a billion. It's got to be in the billions. It has to be. What is the most appropriate carrier pay amount to ship a 2009 Ford Explorer from Atlanta to Kansas City? Ooh. Okay. Okay, I personally, I'm going to go ahead and guess. Personally, 720. Good question, Ty. Does it run, right? What we're going to do is, and I think this is the way Larry works, is if it's not mentioned, then assume it's okay. So he would say, if it was an in-op, Larry would say it's an in-op, okay? 
Okay, great. Thank you very much. We got one more ready. Fingers on the buzzers. If your rail car of freight has a destination of Chicago, but mistakenly continues to Baltimore, your rail car is... Cool. So those are your five. So go to dispatchcenter.com forward slash ask Larry, submit your answers, and we want to, you know, we want to see you win. Be a winner. Go to the ATI Insider sign up page on autotransportintel.com. You can get on the weekly email blast. Talk to Ty. If you're really nice, he might share his phone number in the live chat. Probably do that anyways. Great. Oh, I'm famished. Okay, so, oops, here it is. Okay, so it's time for a little bit of ELD punch. We're at the halfway point. Do me a favor, stick around. We're going to be right back. Hey, it's Ty, transport guy. Hanging out in the transport parking lot always. If you want to learn to grow your business, I think you should probably go to ATI Insider. Sign up for free. Don't give anybody any money. Uh, and with that, you get, uh, I don't know, I think you get a 20 minute phone call, which usually turns into a little longer than that. You get to join the round table, uh, which is once a month. And at the round table, what we do is we get pretty detailed about how to build your business, how to connect with dealers, how to connect with auctions, how to build a lane. So if you're new, if you saw a YouTube video and says, I can make a million dollars in a week and I want to get into car hauling, Ty, and maybe you own a stinger, maybe you own a little rollback. Man, how do I figure this out? Should I buy this? Should I buy that? What do I need? How do I do it? You get to make relationships with other carriers. It's kind of not a one size fits all. It's here a little bit about you. Go to the ATI Insider, get signed up. I can help you. I really can. Ty wants to hear from you. Ty wants to help you. He's in the live chat. Everybody's in the live chat helping out. We got an email address in here. Perfect. Jacksportdispatch at gmail.com. Saw some interesting comments, too. Jeff wants to hear from you if you are down in, uh, what is it, Mannheim, Florida? Ocoee, Mannheim? Uh, Bart Landon, good question about ACV. Why do you have to wait to get on the ACV load board? Because I've actually called many times to get a call back. That's one of the things I love about doing this channel is that, uh, you know, we try to connect with folks to try to help them out. And um, I don't have the answer for you, but I'd love to get it. Ty, we should check in with Matt over at ACV and see if we can get the answer for him. Let's try to do that. So, rail car shipping. CP Rail agrees to buy Kansas City Southern for $25 billion. It will create a freight rail network that stretches from Canada to Mexico. Very interesting. I believe that will be talked about tonight. The combination, the biggest purchase of a U.S. asset by a Canadian company since 2016. Mexico is a crucial supplier of vehicles, auto parts. Kansas City has a unique network linking Mexico. Very interesting stuff. Uh, here, credit where credit is due. This was from Automotive Logistics. I was looking for, I was looking around, sniffing around for who's got rail car shipping news that we can include in one show. So here's an Automotive Logistics. Upon the restart of production in May 2020 and in close coordination with the GM sales and marketing team, measures including transporting light-duty pickups by road instead of rail. Aha! Very interesting. By road? You hear that? By road instead of rail. Why would that be? It's an interesting topic. GM moves thousands of reconsigned vehicles across the network from rental and fleet to retail. In, in, in addition... It increased collaboration with its rail carriers. Now that's interesting too, because all, less than 2% of rail car shipping is used, which we're going to find out more about tonight. And I only know that because of talking to Lisa. She's going to be on the show. I'm telling you, you have a question? This is it. This is going to be great. And if you miss the live show, you're watching later, you're watching on demand, you know, it's 2057 and you're like, wow, this is one heck of a show. Uh, go ahead and put your comments in the YouTube below, in the YouTube comments below the video. We'll see if we can uh, get that answered in 2064. Lack of transparency. This is from Louie at LC Connect. Talking about, uh, these were his notes. Many OEMs have cut down on costs by changing from standard trucking to intermodal with rail, etc. Very interesting stuff there. 
Uh, why do here? This is a forum I found. Why do Tesla forum? Why do automakers use rail to transport their vehicles? Tesla uses truck to ship their cars. It's a lot better than using rail. So said. Well, the, uh, this uh, comment, shipping by rail is actually quite cheap possibly half the cost of truck shipping however it's time consuming doesn't address the last mile because what did we say rail doesn't go to the dealer the u.s is facing a supply chain crisis as 21 cargo ships float off the coast of la waiting to dock now wait jay you just shit wait you just you just shifted from rail to port i did this has got to be impacting well everything including rail I want to ask that question. Will somebody please take a note? I want to ask about what's going on. 21 cargo ships off of Long Beach? Can you imagine? Oh, my God. And you're supposed to be home or whatever? Wow. Uh, now, why do you go to a Tesla forum to learn where your car is? Hello, Mr. M. Can you tell? I'm looking at the ship list. The arrival of, <laughs> of the Tugela and Z should be on September. But the arrival, what's going on? I point this out. I actually was, I was talking to a guy and he, he bought a Tesla. He's overseas, say like Europe ish and, uh, has no idea where the car is. Bought it online. That was easy. Where is the car now? No idea. Probably checking on a Tesla forum. I don't know with, you know, dial up. California ports in LA and Long Beach do account for a third of us imports. 21 sitting there. Seems out of order, Jay. The normal number of container ships and anchors usually between zero and one. We're at 21 right now. Part of the problem is the ships are double and triple the size. Seems like you're skipping around a lot. Local dealerships affected by nationwide car shortage. Look at that. Newsflash. <laughs> right? Because, man, we got to have some kind of alert. Whether it's a oh, there's high winds alert, or there's a low winds alert, or local dealership affected by nationwide car shortage alert. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But there really is this alert. We've got this alert now. Oh, it's the semiconductor chip. We already went through this. Uh, this is why classic cars are leaving Canada by the hundreds. Offshore buyers are pulling loads of collectibles. Can't get them out fast enough. They ship five containers full of vehicles every day. Hope you're not shipping off the coast of Long Beach. I'm just saying. Uh, Biden wants to buy EVs. We've seen this story before, but are there enough cars? There's currently 645,000 federal vehicles. Fewer than 1% are electric. I don't know about you. Web it's Webinar City with EVs lately, and it's going to be that. It's going to stay that way. It's going to be webinar city with evs so you can learn a lot that's the good news learn a lot about batteries uh you know oh and the hub the, here's an interesting one you know the the hubs of the wheels have the motors what if you want to off-road okay wall experts project a seven percent increase i'm just saying i'm just i'm just just stirring it up but there's an ev boom set to go in overdrive Okay, you want to know the 10 hottest? Here, get your notes. Get your notes. 10 hottest EVs. Ready? Okay, number one is the 2022 Chevy Bolt. Okay, that's the one pictured. In addition to that, we got the 2021 Ford Mustang Mach-E, the 21 Hyundai Kona Electric, 21 Hyundai Ionic Electric, 21 Lincoln Aviator Grand Touring. Five more to go. Nissan Leaf, RAV4 Prime, Volvo XC40 and XC60 Recharge, and Volkswagen ID4. Look for those. Find out how you can haul more. Where'd I go? There's a moment. Okay. Now this... Okay. Things are changing. I know. It's crazy. Washington State sets a 2030 target date for banning the sale of gas-powered cars. And they are not alone, folks. Now, I know California said 2035. Looks like Quebec has said 2035. But some European countries are doing 2030. Dude. What? Wow. Okay. DHL powers up its offering for electric vehicle logistics. 
with DHL EV TV. Really? Yeah. DHL EV TV? Google it. First one is about economic impact of the environment. It's pretty interesting. DHL EV TV. Uh, and I, you know, I looked something up. I went to Safer Sis. Check this out. Okay. You might be able to be the first to get electric vehicle transport. Nobody's taken that name yet. Is that amazing? Wow. I would expect, I would expect that in six months, you run that search, somebody has it. Electric vehicle transport is not taken. That's insane. Now, I don't know about the dot com. I should have checked that before I started announcing stuff live. But anyways, Auto Transport Intel goes live four times a week. See, you can get crazy ideas here. Crazy. It's not just it's not just a channel. It's also a community. And basically, it's 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 a, it's just a basic necessity. You need Auto Transport Intel, and you can get it four times a week. Join us tomorrow on DOT Compliance. It's noon every Wednesday. MC Authority, FMCSA, good times. Um. So, what do you think? How we doing? I don't know, but I bet you can't stump Brian, your DOT guy. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's Two Bears Transportation. That's David. What's up, David? Uh, join us on Thursday's Load Board Search on Dispatching Live. That's at noon. That's a good time, too. Uh, we got the Muggo problems. We roll the dice. We count the money. Man, we got so much money. Okay. Um, and then on Fridays, Dealers, Auctions, and Carriers. Fridays at noon. That is an amazing show. And thank you, Ty. For all the hard work you do. Yes, Friday's show was incredible. America's Auto Auction and Black Widow Imaging on Cars on the Move, live on Auto Transport until last Friday. If you didn't see it, check that out. That was a great show. And I imagine there's going to be many more in that format to come. Wow, check this out. Next Tuesday night, we got women in auto transport only on Auto Transport Intel. As far as I know, this show's never been done. Join us. We have, right now, I know there's at least 10 women signed up. And it, hey, are you are you female and you want to be on the show? Put it in the live chat. We'll put you on the show. If, you were, if you're an auto transport business professional and you're female, join us for women in auto transport. Men will be in the live chat. Women will be on the Zoom meeting. It's going to be women in auto transport and... That's going to be awesome. Man, it's going to be a great show. What is the Auto Transport 21? Dang. That's all I'm going to say. That is going to be a great show that's coming up in two weeks. Two weeks from tonight. And then three weeks from tonight, Carrier Load Boss. This channel is off the hook. I'm telling you. Wow, I'm really excited. Got some great stuff lined up. This is the Car Shipping Business Channel. There we go. Car Shipping Business Channel. And you're here. And we're live. And we're we're engaging. And we're learning. And we're sharing. It's amazing. Thank you. I'm so, I'm so glad you're a part of it. Um, what we're going to do is, after the break, we're going to be live with Jeff, Peter, and Lisa. And we're going to jump into new vehicle shipping by rail. You're not going to want to miss it. Stick around. We'll be right back. Are you completely stressed out from all the calls and the contracts and the verification of loads when nobody answers the phone? Call Murphy Auto Dispatch Services today. Murphy Auto Dispatch Services has over 15 years of experience in the transport industry. We are your office while you are on the road. We book, we verify, and we bill out your loads for you. We have an excellent accounting staff and an even better dispatch team. Give us a call today at 417-273-0021. Or if you want to email me, it's murphyautotransport31 at yahoo.com. Give us a call today. That is the voice of Sue. 
and she wants to help you. If you're looking for a dispatcher, um, if you're looking for, she runs a dispatch office. She's also a fully licensed broker, and she is my co-host every Thursday on Dispatching Live on Auto Transport Intel. We're going to have uh, Jeff, Peter, and Lisa up in here in a second. I just want to say that uh, for anybody that's going to be joining the show tonight, if you're watching the YouTube stream, you have to mute that or shut it down entirely. Not you out there in TV land. Um, and also in the live chat, please do say hello in the live chat. Tim is saying hello. Yeah, wow. See, right? Isn't that... And you know what's cool, Tim? And Tim does a great show. Uh, is that Tim and Paul both have been making the circuit quite a bit, making a lot of media. Paul Meyer knows this. Paul Machine knows this. Tim Scoutalis know, knows this. That when you're putting out content, man, it keeps you busy, doesn't it? Um, but it also makes you think about the next show and the next show. This is show 186 in a row, which is pretty crazy on a Tuesday night. Um, but that's how long it took to get to an important vehicle uh, vertical like rail car shipping. I've got my guests here, so I think it's time to say hello. Jeff, Lisa, can you see me and hear me okay? Yes. Yep. I can see you. All good. Great. Okay. Jeff, I had you first on the lineup, so please do say hello and introduce yourself to the Tuesday Night's Live audience. Hey, hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Grandstaff. I'm uh, live from Columbus, Ohio, a third-party logistics company and a transportation brokerage called Ship Cars Now. And both of those are um, wholly owned subs of the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, I now have my own consultant. Will you please say hello to the Tuesday Night's Live audience? Railroad. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Hanmer. I'm the president of Transport Perspectives. I've been in the automotive business and logistics space for 20 years, and I have my own consulting company, and I've been consulting for about three and a half. Great. And then I just want to say this one more time. So I know that I, I always ask everyone to, uh, to, to when you're, when you're going to join the show, go ahead and watch the YouTube stream. But then when you join the show, you got to either mute it or shut it down entirely because I hear a loop in the background, but it's just, it's just business. It's just uh, housekeeping. So let's do this. Peter, please say hello to the Tuesday night's live audience. Hello, my name is Peter Daly. I've been in the logistics industry for 45 years. Happy to be Hello, here tonight. Peter Daly. I've been in the okay, great. Thank you so much. Now, um, do me a favor. Before we go forward, I just I still hear in the background a the looping of the audio, and it's a, it can be distracting for the audience. Um, I'm also I'm actually kind of used to it, and I think the live chat's used to it. I don't know how many shows I've done where I've, I've, I've either messed up the video, I've messed up the audio, um, the internet goes crazy, and so we've got a really patient audience. But just do double check if you're watching the YouTube stream that we don't hear it in the background. And now I think it's time to, here we go, new vehicle shipping by rail. Um, guys... We, we've, we've talked before, we've talked a couple times offline in preparation for the show. Lisa, you put these notes together. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing notes. Thank you so much. For <laughs> this, is, this is great stuff. And, and so, I mean, there's so much to talk about. Where should we start? I think we started with, we talked about, like, you know, let's say somebody, whether you're, if you're in an OEM, you know a lot about this. And if you're a carrier, you know from the perspective of picking up and dropping, well, picking up at a rail yard, right? But starting us off, let's start with some of the basics of rail car shipping. Like what an auto rack trailer is, et cetera. Where do we start? Who wants to take that? Sure. I, um, the railroad has several different kinds of rail cars, and um, most of the vehicles are shipped in what's called an auto rack. It's an industry term. And uh, some are also shipped in containers, but uh, very low volume in there. And auto rack, you'll see them uh, uh, off the side on the railroad or moving on the railroad. 
Uh, they're the ones with the large graffiti on the, the sides sometimes. <laughs> a lot of artwork there, but uh, they come in different uh, shapes uh, to haul different types of vehicles. Uh, a unit level hauls, uh, has one level, and it hauls big stuff like Class 8 trucks or campers, things like that. Um, sprinter vans, uh, and then a bi-level, two-level rail car has uh, two levels about, what, 90 inches uh, high or so, and that's for pickup trucks, vans, minivans, uh, and that kind of thing. And then there's a tri-level, and that hauls um, automobiles, 60-inch uh, height, so uh, five feet of clearance there, so loading and unloading those, that's a tight space to work in. So those are the, the basic kinds of, of rail cars, and um, those are grouped into uh, trains and moved across the country from plants and ports of, over to railheads. But uh, no trains go to dealerships, as far as I know, so it takes a truck on the other end uh, to deliver that final, final leg of the journey. I liked how, okay, Lisa, you had in here, how many how many rail cars make up a uh, full auto train? Who wants to talk more about that? Um, so about 65 uh, rail cars can make up a full auto train somewhere in that neighborhood. And, and at that point, you're carrying about 1,000 vehicles. And so uh, the equivalent of that, would it would take about 100 trucks and drivers to move those 1,000 vehicles. Um, so... When you're moving long distances, it makes sense to think about moving rail uh, long distances with large repetitive moves like the manufacturers have. Uh, usually around 700 miles is where it makes sense uh, to ship on rail versus truck. What, say, in that scenario, that OEM, how many vehicles on average do you think they need to move um, since they're moving so many? What, that's the thing, things have changed so much, right? Yeah, so about 75 to 80% of new vehicles will ship on rail. Um, so that's in the neighborhood right now, current production volumes, that'd be around 12 million vehicles that will move on rail. All right, Peter. Well, I think I'll, I'd like to add something to what Jeff said about the rail cars. And what's important today is the fact that you've got so many of the larger vehicles. So years ago, everybody drove cars. Now they're driving SUVs. So what the industry did was they got together and tried to produce a universal rail car, a rail car that could be converted. They call it the convertible rail car. And it can be converted between a bi-level and a tri-level. So most of today's cars are shipped on bi-level type rail cars. Well, yeah, that, and that makes sense. Um, we do know that as far as new vehicles, I think trucks are considered in high demand on average. Um, although I'd be curious what the financial and volume impact has been on rail lately. Do we have any numbers on that? I know I'm jumping ahead, but yeah. we're going to jump around a bit. Okay. Um, no, I don't have any numbers on that as far as the current financial impact or, or of the pandemic? Well, we'll sidebar that. But yeah, I mean, and that thing is, I know Paul Machine, and I, I, he's from Black Book, and hopefully he's able to tune in in the live chat. Just some of the data, some of the financial and volume data points. Um, but we'll, we'll come back to that. We've, we've still got more bank six to go through. So we've got... Um, it, is there a way to put a percentage on how many OEMs load to rail from the plant rather than trucking it to the rail? Uh, I don't know that offhand. I know that um, you know there's various forms. Some of plant load, and then there's some uh, manufacturers who use mixing centers or mixing vehicles from different plants to into a central location loading out of there some obviously come from overseas ports on the east coast ports on the west coast uh but um no um 
I don't have that. I think it's I think it's probably a, a you know just a guess, probably less than fifty percent, but that's a total guess. And also, there are how many major rail lines are there? There are seven class one railroads, um, and that's kind of an interesting point right now. The, the CP has um, put out a bid for the KCS, so both of those fall within that range. And then just today, I saw some news that CN is also putting in a bid for KCS. So if either CP or CN were to acquire KCS, then there would be six class one railroads operating in the U.S. And that will make CP or CN the only railroad that operates across all of North America, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Ah, so not only is this, and, it, and I thought I read, was CP in the smaller groups, and now this acquisition puts them near the top? I'm not sure, but, but based on what you just said, Obviously, we know mergers and acquisitions happen everywhere. That sounds like a really big deal, especially given changes in recent climate. Yeah, it's a huge deal. And the, the CN, that was just announced today that they're putting in a better, a more attractive bid to, to buy the KCS. So uh, it'll be interesting how it all plays out. And then you have the Surface Transportation Board um, scrutinizing the deal making sure that it's not a, you know, too much, too much of a railroad. Well, that's, and that's kind of, I mean, I was thinking something like that in, in the back of my mind, but I'm, you know, it's, uh, and they're, they're renaming, it's going to have a new name, right? Is I'm not sure. CP, not sure. I thought I read something. Okay. Lisa? I'm not. I'm not sure what what the announced uh, proposed name would be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Fair and enough. And I think I yeah. I think I read that to get the approval that Jeff is talking about takes between a year and eighteen months. So it's not anything that will happen real quickly. So this is ah. So this is not a done deal. No. No. And in addition to the class one railroads, there are 500 plus regional and short line railroads. So the class one railroads have your main lines, those are the biggest players, but then you have, you know, hundreds of smaller regional and short line and conglomerate railroads that um, make up the rest of the tracks across the U.S. And there is about 140,000 miles of track that covers the United States. So that number is pretty wild because just one mile of track. When I think of the amount of work that goes into one mile of track, it's kind of staggering. It is. It so is. there's 140,000 miles of track. That's a lot of logistics. It is. Um, the uh, yeah, There's maintenance crews out there. They have engineering crews. They repair the, the rails or repair the, uh, the ballast, the rocks that you see on railroad tracks. That's called ballast. And replacing that, refilling that, um, it's uh, just an engineering marvel to see some of the things they do. Uh, remember in the floods, uh, the Missouri River in, in um, the um, early 2000s, or excuse me, yeah, around 2006 or seven, the um, Union Pacific raised uh, the track six feet up in the air uh, with more ballast to get the... Uh, the track up out of the water and there's uh, floods and things that they, they park rock trains on to on bridges to keep them from washing away so it's just a lot of engineering marvels that they go through to get through the weather to, to keep the uh, all the goods moving not just automobiles but all the goods so That's as great. opposed to the highways the railroads are in charge of their own infrastructure right yeah, I saw that. So you're saying that they build, maintain, operate, and pay for their, for, for their own infrastructure, so the government's not involved in that, in upkeep? or No, each railroad has a, has a plan, and then they, they uh, execute to, to, the, to you know, the budget or the plan, but, uh, but all told, it's 
uh, well over a hundred billion dollars that's put into the infrastructure with that's, all the railroads. That is pretty amazing. Um, yeah, really great stuff. So then let's talk about uh, you've got or no, that's the wrong one. So then the with the railroads, the railroads, and this reminds me of what I what I think I've learned about ports. They hire other logistics companies to load and unload. They don't do that themselves. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, that's correct. So um, they hire third party uh, contractors to do the loading and the unloading of the rail cars. Um, so those individuals, when the vehicles come into the facility, would inspect the vehicles and then uh, load them onto the rail car. And vehicles are loaded on rail cars using uh, buck ramps to drive the vehicles into the rail car and then secured with chops um, and then ship to destination. And then when it reaches destination, there'll be a crew there who goes in and inspects the vehicle and, and unloads the vehicles from the rail car. Right, so you've so, got, yeah, go ahead, please. Please, Peter. Not only do they inspect the vehicles, they have to inspect the rail car to make sure it is safe and clean in order to transport those vehicles. And all that is done to uh, AAR or, or American Association of Railroad Standards. And any facility uh, can get on, audited at any time. So um, a good audit score, the best, is, is 100. So, uh, you know, if your facility's uh, getting in the high 90s on, on the audits, uh, that's a great, great score. And I was going to say, let's see, here's an, here, here we go. You saw the game show earlier. Here we go. Ready? What is the number of multi-level rail cars in circulation today? What the answer? <laughs> I, 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 I like the suspense, but yeah, I want the answer. <laughs> It's around, around 66,000 uh, in there, and about two-thirds of that is the bi-level uh, rail car. So uh, right in the neighborhood of 66,000. And that, uh, that fleet circulates throughout North, uh, North America. Uh, so it's interesting uh, how they've come to that solution. 66,000 multi-level rail cars. The, it, it, the, the size of this operation is kind of mind-boggling. It, it really is. And the, the issue is there's probably, if you were a manufacturer, you'd say there's not enough rail cars. If you were a railroad, you say there's more than enough rail cars. It's trying to get the effective utilization of those rail cars that is very important and that a lot of time and effort on behalf of all the railroads and the manufacturers uh, occurs. And and then you add technology. So, okay, so Lisa, I think you mentioned, so when the rail cars, the geofencing or what do they call them? There's things on the side. Yeah, please tell me more. Um, so for tracking purposes, when the vehicles are moving on rail car, there's sensors on the side of the track that scan the rail cars that move over those sensors. And that's how they provide location information back to the manufacturer of the rail cars as they're moving along their journey from their origin to their destination. And one of the other places that um, they use a lot of forecasting information and technology is in the TTX reloads planning all of the rail cars are put together into a pool and there's a lot that goes into deciding where the empty rail cars are shipped to and how that's distributed and and uh, peter is really a, an expert on that if he wants to take over <laughs> well i think you've covered that point very well <laughs> excellent because we have a question ty's got a question in the live chat do they deal directly with the oems and I think the question is, who's they? Uh, if it's the railroads, yes. The railroads deal directly with the OEMs. They have multi-year contracts. And they negotiate uh, with the OEM, come up with rates uh, 
for uh, moving vehicles, uh, damage, uh, uh, not damage free frequency goals, uh, cost saving goals, new ideas, uh, lots of different things go into the, the negotiations. But yes, they're, they're, that's uh, who they have their contracts with. And I think then on the OEM level, if you were to reverse that, the OEM would say, well, we deal with rail, we deal with ocean vessel, and we deal with trucking fleets, right? It seems like there, there, there's kind of a lot of parallels between port and rail in some of these respects. Yeah, there's there's various modes, and various modes have uh, uh, there's pros and cons to each. So, uh, as Lisa said, large volume, long distance. That's a good move over land, obviously, is good by rail. Um, the large volume, long distance uh, vessel moves. Uh, some vessels haul up to 5,000 vehicles or probably more by now. Uh, so they're, they're massive in and of themselves. Uh, trucks are great for uh, quick uh, moves here and there, more nimble than either the, the rail or the, the vessels. So, um, but uh, you know, the plants and the ports, that's where the main uh, uh, new vehicles are shipped to and from. What is geobaying? Uh, so a facility, a rail automotive facility can be organized or, or grouped into areas of the yard based on the destination of the vehicles. And so it's a way to organize the yard space um, to increase the speed and efficiency with which the trucking company can go in and find the vehicles that they need that are going to a similar location. So if it's done correctly, it should increase the vehicle throughput through the facility, which is a win-win for the railroad because they don't want to have to store the vehicles any longer than they need to. And the trucking company can efficiently get in and out of the yard in a, in a quick manner and um, maybe get in an extra load because they save time looking for those vehicles. So to further expand on that, you've got a yard in the Midwest and they're going to send some vehicles to Texas. They're going to send some vehicles to the Northwest. They're going to send some to California. You don't want all those vehicles mixed in. You want them where they can easily be grabbed for a common destination, put on the same rail car. So, so you're not sending cars all over and double touching vehicles. They usually do that. Load, uh, they can get into load lines at, at some point where that load line just goes on the same same rail car, same route. With the advent, with you know, been a lot of changes in technology. Uh, is it? Do they have a much better idea of where the, all the cars are at one time, or is there still confusion in that? Are there can't be that much confusion left, right? Uh, when the unloader parks the vehicle in the facility, they'll scan the vehicle and attach a bay location to that vehicle, which keeps track of where the vehicle is in the yard. There have been a lot of advancements and there's a lot of tools available in the marketplace right now um, where you can use GPS trackers and Bluetooth technology and RFID um, to set up at a large facility to help um, expedite the, the location of the vehicles or, or help a trucker to find a location of a vehicle based on specific GPS information from those trackers. So um, there are tools out there. The tools that are in place uh, work fairly well. They usually do monthly uh, physical inventories at a rail facility to make sure the vehicles are in the proper bay locations and uh, any empty spaces are accounted for. Uh Please. The rail facilities, the ramps have a fixed number of bays, and the volume is not a constant volume. You have peaks and valleys. So, you know, uh, working the best you can uh, between the truck and railroad, that's where uh, facility uh, is successful. So, through those high volumes, getting more trucks in through that company's sister locations or through some uh, other. Uh, uh, trucking companies, you know, working through that volume. 
And then when it's there's not much volume, say in the winter months, for example, uh, you have the elements battle, but the, the geobaying is, is a bit easier at that time. Eco-friendly? Rail is definitely eco-friendly. <laughs> right. Um, a, rail car, a rail car can move uh, more than a ton of freight on 470 miles to a gallon of fuel. So it is it is massive what they are able to, to move with the electric diesel. Uh, uh, the engine in and of itself is I think uh, 2,000 tons of power uh, generated uh, by electric power generated by diesel. And they're looking at alternative fuels now, uh, compressed natural gas, uh, different things there to make them more uh, uh, emissions, uh, decreasing those emissions, more environmentally friendly. And it, it's, it, what's interesting about that and again, thanks for that note, Lisa, because, you know, I wouldn't have that without you, is that that's a big thing with ocean vessel. It's amazing how much news gets put into environmental friendly changes in the fuel or energy of powering an ocean vessel. So given this topic, I mean, in the EV future, it, rail's not going away. Is I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think so. Uh, just as trucks aren't going to go away, there'll be diff. there be different ways to operate them, uh, improvements and, and that kind of thing. But uh, um, no, the rails rails not going away. It's great for the the large um, commodity movements. Um, I think that, uh, for example, at Union Pacific when I was there. Uh, rail only made or for autos only made up about eight per eight or nine percent of the revenue. So all those other commodities that are moving by rail, oil, coal, uh, all kinds of different chemicals, uh, wind turbines, uh, combines, tanks. You know, you, the list goes on and on. And, and you know, when I brought up that story, when you, when you hear about what's going on, 21 cargo ships off the coast of California, how does that affect rail? It's That's just like the, any... Go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. It, it puts Please a monkey ahead. wrench into the whole system. A little while ago, Jay, you asked if they had the system running well, and, and they, they really do, but... There are things that happen. There are there are storms. There's strikes, and and the situation now with the cargo ships backed up that puts stress on the entire system. And when you only have those sixty six thousand plus rail cars, it puts more burden on the efficient use of those rail cars. Right. It's a pig moving through the pipeline, right? So <laughs> it it, uh, it affects all the the downstream modes from the, from that point. Perfect time for this question in the live chat. How much time is spent moving a vehicle a thousand miles on, by rail? It varies um, depending on the lane uh, and on the type of train that it's running on. Say a, a train that's uh, completely comprised of auto, uh, auto racks. Uh, that 65 uh, rail cars that Lisa was talking about, that can go across country in, in I would say, uh, 10 days, something like that, which sounds like a long time, but it's it's moving constantly, at a, sometimes at a slow speed, sometimes they're switching between railroads or, or, or uh, you know, uh, switch, but... Uh, it's a flow. It's a, it's a river flowing of, of the new vehicles, and they, they just keep streaming them out, just like they do at the plant, streaming them out of there. Uh, yeah. East to west movements are probably faster than north to south for you know general. 
It is. It's really interesting as, as you describe it as a flow. A pig through a python. Love that. <laughs> um, question. <laughs> of what I was going to ask is then, but then that, that is, when you say that, you know, you're moving the same amount as 100 trucks with 65 rail cars, that is, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of incomparable. We'll take a few extra days for 100 trucks worth of movement, right? <laughs> At a cheaper price. Well, and the added benefit to moving some of those vehicles on rail is that there's reduced congestion on the roads. There is, um, you know, less wear and tear on the highway system and the infrastructure. And um, there's low damage frequency on rail. And again, as we talked about, low carbon footprint. So there's lots of benefits. But, you know, at the end of the day, it takes everyone working together to get these vehicles delivered. You also mentioned rail is involved in the entire vehicle life cycle. So, yeah, what's the backhaul like? The rail mo takes it, the cars from the OEM. Yeah, talk more about that because that's got to be interesting in logistics. Yeah, Peter, you want to tee that one up? Well, the backhaul, I thought that was probably more up your alley, Jeff, but um, it, hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't been as effective as people initially hoped because you're competing with the new vehicle production and that takes precedent over the movement of used cars. Now, there's a lot of empty rail cars that move back to the plant and many people try to come up with a system, whether it's moving parts or used cars on the return trip. Nobody's gotten it right yet. Right. Now, that's very interesting because yeah. that's what happens in trucking. That's right. So with the, this pool of 66,000 rail cars throughout North America, once it, it moves from Detroit to Los Angeles, they try to reload that rail car uh, at the port uh, there, or they may ship that rail car back empty to, to Kansas City or to Mexico. Uh, they may ship it to, to San Francisco uh, to uh, fill out a load up there. but. Uh, they, they try to uh, utilize that rail car at the closest point. Uh, but getting back to the life cycle, you know, separating that from backhaul and utilization, uh, railroad moves raw materials into uh, plants that make uh, panels and components and, and uh, seats and things like that for uh, automobiles. And those are shipped to, the parts are shipped to assembly plants, new vehicles are made. Uh, you and I use those vehicles, they become used, and, and sometimes those used vehicles are shipped on rail. We did that at Ship Cars Now, and, and uh, uh, still a lot of vehicles, used vehicles are moved on rail. When they've gone beyond their life uh, and, and go into the salvage mode, uh, those are recycled, the metals are recycled, hauled on rail again back to uh, you know, the beginning of the circle and starting all over again, basically. So the issue here is the multi-level is a specialty rail car. And uh, right. they, they don't carry really anything other than vehicles. The, the other thing I wanted to add was, and you keep mentioning the ports, years ago there was a lot more vehicles that were imported. Now it's more the manufacturers are sourcing their vehicles in the country where they sell those vehicles. But you used to have a much better backhaul from the port areas than you do today. I, I don't know, Lisa, maybe you have some stats on how many vehicles are actually imported into the U.S. of the 17 or so million vehicles they sell. I'm not sure how many are imports. Uh, I don't have those figures offhand. Jeff, would you have an idea of what that volume is? No, I don't. I don't, but I agree with your analysis, your your words there, Peter. That uh, there's a lot more uh, transplanted um, um, automobile plants in the U.S. Uh, so they're sourcing the vehicles here rather than shipping them uh, across the ocean. Awesome. Um, you know what I want to do is uh, 
I I'm gonna hold. I've got some more carrier specific that we're gonna bring up in the panel discussion, but I want to. Uh, oh, we uh, we don't have an internet issue. Okay, I want to bring up uh, some of this, um, Peter. I think this was a PDF that you had, and yeah. I just want to go through some of these slides. If you'll if you'll narrate and I'll I'll move the slides. What what are we looking at here? That's the U.S. rail network. And Jeff, in our preliminary discussions, you mentioned that it's not necessarily true that automobiles run along each of those routes. Right. But that's the entire rail network on the U.S. Right, entire right. rail <laughs> network. Right. Right. I'm sorry. It's uh, wow. <laughs> that is amazing. And still somebody saying, like I think you said earlier, can we get some rail down here? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got, okay, this is more kind of what, specifics about dimensions of your multi-levels? Yes. Which obviously, if you're you know if you're a carrier or a fleet, some of these numbers you might want to jot them down, get out your scratch pad, or take a take a picture. Be the first to take a picture of the screen on Auto Transport <laughs> Intel. Thank you for doing that. I think one of the important things to note here would be the um, the load capacity. So a by level, you'd ship eight to ten vehicles usually, and in a high level. You're talking about smaller passenger cars, so you can fit 12 to 15 on a tri-level. And those are secured by chocks that are placed in, in front of and behind wheels of the vehicle. When I started in the mid 80s, we were chaining vehicles down and uh, there was no roof uh, on the rail cars like they're, the one in the picture there. Um, there was more open uh, to it, so it was Exposed to the elements, exposed to damage, vandalism, that kind of thing. So uh, there's been innovation in securing uh, the vehicles inside the rail car and keeping uh, vandals out as well as protecting the vehicles. It's very low damage frequency on the on the rail, on the rail truck scenario. Try level. Those are great photos. Yeah. That's a articulate. Is that an articulating um, tri level on the right back there? Go Peter? back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure. Yeah. So some rail cars articulate. They share a, what's called a truck, and that's the set of wheels uh, that you see under a rail car. So, yeah, in the midpoint, uh, they share. Uh, a wheelbase or a truck there. So there's uh, three trucks under under the two uh, rail cars that articulate together. So like, would that be like one of those buses that bends in the middle? Correct. No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> hey. Yeah, ding, ding. Ding, ding. <laughs> what, are, what are we looking at here? Is this, is this kind of more recent stuff? What is... That's this would be, the, uh, the unit level. That's the inside of a brand new bi level. Oh, bi level. How do we know it's a bi level? How do you know that? Just the size of the deck there, the space between the the bottom and the top. Okay. And the the grates down there, the uh, metal uh, you see there, that's where the chocks clamp onto to secure the the vehicle. Uh, then the doors are are shut on either end and sealed. Uh, keeping people out that aren't authorized to to get in the rail car. Are those the, the? I'm sorry. Are those chalks on the sides there with the red and the green? Are those chalks? Yes. Okay. That's where they store them when not in use. Smart. You can also see the protection they use on the side of the rail car. Right. The other reason I know it's a bi level is I don't think they've made a tri level in ten years. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> because it's all trucks now, trucks and SUVs? Yeah. yeah. Right. Larger vehicles. Crossovers. Yeah. If gas uh, prices go back north of $5 a gallon or you know, $4 a gallon, you'll see a lot more tri-levels uh, in, in action or bringing them out of storage. This is pretty interesting. So these are kind of engineering specs? Yeah, that's correct. You had asked to see the uh, the size of the decks and how right. you know, they, they spec it out. All right. That's this is where, okay, last chance fleet managers to take a photo of the screen. <laughs> And then we've—I think we have another one, don't we? Uh, wait a minute, that was—that's a tri-level. And then this one. Okay, this is a bi-level. Okay. Interesting. Great stuff. Wow, that is great stuff. Um, so it just so happens that we're right on time for the panel discussion. Now, I don't know um, I don't know who can stay and if anybody needs to go, everybody is welcome to stay, but if you need to go, otherwise I'm going to start bringing you. Do you need to go, Lisa? Yeah, I was going to jump off, but I'd just like to say thank you for including me. I think it's great that Auto Transport Intel is fostering curiosity and collaboration and, and learning in the industry. So thank you so much for having me on the show tonight. And uh, hopefully I'll get to meet you in person at some point. That is, thank you very much. And Lisa, you really were instrumental in putting this together with all this information. You brought in Jeff, you brought in Peter. So we owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you so much for doing that and then for taking the time tonight. Oh, thanks, Jay. Yeah. Thank you. Right, thanks, Lisa. Great yes. job. And Jay, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave as well. Sure. Um, well, I, listen, I thank you for your time and contribution as well. So, Lisa and Peter, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jay. Thanks for having me. Okay. Goodbye. Oh, okay, goodbye. And we're going to keep Jeff. Jeff is going to be able to stay on for a little bit longer. Let me go ahead and bring in our other panelists. Um, do me a favor. If you've got... Uh, if you got some questions, I know I didn't get to... I have not gotten to questions yet. Let's see, we got Ty, we've got Robbie, and um, let me make sure I've got everything set here, and then Alex is going to join us, and um, there goes the invite to Ty, Robbie, and Alex. They'll be able to tell you more about who they are. Well, you guys know Ty, and Alex is going to be on Cars on the Move on Friday, and you know Robbie. Robbie's been on here, he was on a... I think it was the January Car Shipping Roundtable. He's been on here with some other panels. He was on the Plateau Show. Um, so this is going to be great. Uh, and again, please do, if you're able to, if you're able to shed any light on anything that's been said, or if you want to add to the questions, please put it in the live chat. And Jeff, you know, thanks so much for, for sticking around. The other guys here, they're going to start pouring in now. And um, and then so you're going to get to meet some more of the ATI community, which is pretty cool. And it's interesting. So you've got you've got quite a bit of background then in auto transport as far as the business. Yes, various modes. I started uh, with Ryder, like I said, in the mid '80s, uh, starting at the, the 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 bottom and worked my way up to a terminal manager and then Ryder in the mid '80s. Uh, Started in operations, marketing, and sales with, with them. All right, cool. So we've got, okay, so uh, Ty is in here. Robbie's in here. Alex is going to be joining in a second. And they're getting situated because they know also that when you, if you're watching the show, you're settled in, you know, you got your snacks and you know you're kicking it but now you're on the show so you got to mute the audio so here we go um ty can you see us and hear us okay yes i can thanks for having me hi jeff thanks for coming on hey ty nice to meet you nice to meet you did great appreciate you thank you agreed here here 
Robbie is here. Robbie, can you see us and hear us? Yes. Can you see me and hear me? See you, hear you, perfect. Okay. Um, and everybody knows Ty. Like, I mean, you know, Ty this, Ty that, Ty, Ty, Ty. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ty, thank you so much. But I want to, hey, Robbie, will you please introduce yourself for anybody that doesn't know who you are? Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Robbie with LMR Trucking, SEC Auto Transport, SEC Auto Logistics. Um, I run de business development for all three of those uh, companies. All, they're all under the same ownership, so it's not like I'm working for different people. I've been in the industry for quite a while, 20 years. And uh, uh, so we've got an asset-based division of car carriers, uh, nine car stingers, and um, we, we do both uh, OEM and secondary. And, and then we've got an asset light division, uh, which is our brokerage. And, uh, and we uh, you know, use that to bring in excess capacity when, uh, when we've got an influx in inventory. I'm actually, sorry to interrupt you, but I'm really happy Robbie's here tonight because Robbie knows a lot more about rails than I do. <laughs> I know a little. I've never worked uh, for rails, but I, I've certainly managed rail ramps and uh, ports but, um, and plants and things of that nature. So definitely more than familiar me. with working with them. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie, for being here. <laughs> yeah, of course. And before we pull all the chocks out and let all the cars roll around on the tracks, I want to say hello to Alex. Alex, thanks for joining us tonight. Please say hello to the live audience. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me there. Excited. I'm the newbie on the show. Ah, and so Alex, so yeah. what do you do? Where where are you at? Tell us more about that. Uh, so I'm in Denver, and um, I work for a company called TransWest, which is a dealership. So we are a truck dealership. So we sell... Uh, we sell Western Stars and Freightliner, but we also have uh, been selling car haulers for, for quite a while. And so that's where I work. I sell the car haulers. And, and Alex makes amazing YouTube videos with lore trailers and other equipment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trying, just, just getting started. I need to hire my daughters so they can teach me a little bit about editing. At 10 and 11 years old, they know how to use those things like better than any one of us i think hey man Ed and editing yes yeah ty, yeah. ty. Well, speaking, of, speaking of alex and his daughters alex may have to leave just a little bit early your daughter's got a program tonight right <laughs> yeah ironically it's about spending too much time on the screen <laughs> <laughs> here we are so they have they have a school project and their school project is the pros and cons of uh, spending too much time on on iPads and cell phones and stuff like that. So I had to excuse myself because I have to spend some time on, on the screen. <laughs> well, Alex can talk kind of some of the things that I heard in the earlier part of this show tonight, you know, the articulated and the, the trailers. And I mean, I can talk articulated too, but uh, Alex, what do you, what do you think when you hear articulate? Articulate on, on the trailers, like which, which points, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, they were showing us one of the trailers had articulated decks and different things like that. Do you do you mess with that kind of stuff? Yeah, so on the call, yeah, for sure. And, and Robbie's probably pretty familiar because I'm sure he runs a lot of those. Um, but um, yeah, all, all those all those car holder trailers, right? So you have each deck is usually independent, a little less now with the quick loaders, uh, but they're still pretty complex, pretty complex machines. So everybody's got their own way to load them. Uh, and it's it's quite interesting. Uh, the more I spend time with truck drivers, the, the more I learn. It's 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 uh it's really cool. That's good. The uh, the decks on the rail cars do not move like a, a truck where you have the one deck uh, that can move one vehicle around. Uh, so it's a flat loading surface. So I've always wondered what uh, how much they could increase the the capacity of a rail car if they had hydraulics or pneumatic decking in there uh, to, uh, you know, uh, in decrease the dead space like a truck yeah. can do. Yeah, it'd be, um, you guys don't have weight restrictions really, right? So weight is not so much an issue, it's just space. Right. So um, you could increase your height possibly by, by stacking the vehicles. Um, right. 
that would be a, a negative. Uh, but uh, yeah, you could probably you could probably add twenty to thirty percent uh, to your capacity if each deck move and a lot of money in maintenance as well. Well, what's interesting is you know we have we call them high mounts, Jeff, and what they they come with what we call self-contained. So we've it's got the entire hydraulic system that runs the entire trailer off of a motor. So you got your is that am I saying that right, Alex? Uh, yeah. So the high mounts are a, a kind of trailer that uh, attaches behind a conventional truck. So any you know same truck that pulls a drive van could pull could pull a high mount. And some people will have a wet kit which allows them to run a PTO. But most people don't on those trucks, so they just okay. connect uh, the trailer to their truck batteries, and then they run what they call electric or hydraulic, which is what they call self-contained. So all your hydraulics run off a 12 volt system, um, and uh, you're able to lift all your decks. I mean, on some some of them have four, six, seven independent decks that you will find on an eight car. Uh, it works. Right. It, that that's not that's with a uh, not a stinger a tractor is that with the normal uh, class eight truck or um... so you got two two types of trucks and, and there's really a big difference now because of the law uh, uh, one is considered a car hauler by federal highway law the other one not which I don't understand why but uh, um, so the stingers. I would say it's more of a truck for the committed car haulers. So your head rack uh, on your tractor, it's basically a truck and a trailer instead of a tractor and a trailer legally. Uh, so your truck has a three car head racks typically, uh, four sometimes for day caps. And, and the Stinger, your fifth wheel is really eight inches off the ground behind the right. truck. And then your trailer connects to that and has uh, six or seven car capacities, depending what trailer it is. Um, and so these are different. So all of those will run uh, a wet kit for the hydraulics, and they'll usually have an electric for backup. Uh, and um, the 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 and it's funny because Fast Act considers those car haulers. So you have special laws where you can be 80 foot, special laws where you can be uh, you can have overhang in the front and in the back. Sure. The guys who run the high mounts those traders somehow they don't they don't partake in that good law and so these guys get tickets to left and right for being over length all the time so it's a little tough for them interesting crazy crazy now as far as getting cars so you, the rail brings them to a yard what do you guys call that robbie on our in our language rail yard rail yard that's what i yep. would call it we go to the rail yard grab grab a load of whatever Yep. So, um, you know, you just don't pull in here. You just, this isn't, this isn't just willy nilly like the auction where you just kind of roll in and I'm here and I'm going to get cars. What, what's that like when you go to the railhead, Robbie? Well, so you're, you're putting the railhead, you know, via a contract with an OEM that, you know, you're, you go through the process and you have a start date and, and typically you're going to either, you know, rent a, uh, you know, a little mobile office that they'll allow you to have, or they'll already have one or you'll have space in the, in the, the rail carrier's office somewhere. And, uh, and so t those guys are in there by contract and, and you're moving freight. And when you, when you've got, you know, an influx, uh, you know, you bring in, you know, third party carriers if you have to, uh, to move the freight. And then as far as, you know, that relationship, you know, the, it, it's certainly beneficial to everybody. If there's a good relationship between the truck away carrier and the, and the rail carrier, they're working together every day. Um, you know, the rail is, is, you know, letting the, the carrier know what they're projected to unload that day based on what their crew is and how many cars, you know, they, they unload on average per day or per hour. And, uh, and, and that of course is all contingent on the amount of volume coming in from the, from the manufacturer. And, uh, you know, so we're both essentially working for the same customer in tandem they're moving the cars off the rail and maintaining the yard and, 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 and typically maintaining security and all of that. And then we, you know, we're of course in there trucking the vehicles away. Um, and it's, it's, it's usually pretty seamless. 
Well, there's often uh, joint damage prevention meetings. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Operational efficiency meetings. Uh, if the railroad uh, unloads late in the day, then the trucking company doesn't have a chance to get the vehicles out to the dealer until the next day. So, you know, getting those rail cars in there, getting them open, getting the vehicles down in time for the the trucks uh, to move them the same day, that's, that makes the a most efficient process for the, the common customer, as you said, the OEM. Yep, you're absolutely right. That's absolutely right. He he gets it. It's, uh, you know, you get you, with your OEM, you get a scorecard, you get graded on your performance. And and one of those criteria are, are your dwell hours from the time that the, you know, the car is released from the plant, port, factory, whatever, uh, in this case, the rail. And so from that moment, the clock's ticking and uh, and you get graded on that. So, yeah, he, you know, the earlier you can get the cars, uh, the more opportunity, because if you don't get them until two or three o'clock in the afternoon, you're still getting graded on that day. And uh, and you typically have got most of your day planned out by then. So it's tough to to start shuffling things around if you've got, you know, priority one sold units or things like that. So it's it's certainly a, um, you know, a, a relationship situation there. And, and like he said, you know, you're uh, you're having, you know, regular meetings, safety meetings, efficiency meetings uh, and all of that with the railroad. Well, that you know, I heard um, the backhaul came up earlier <clears throat> and, and before the answer came out, I was like, I bet you a dollar. It's the same thing it is for the car hauler guys, the trucks. I, I know. It. And so, boom, same thing. And, <clears throat> you know, I, you, Jay, Jay might hear this and think, wow, you this this just is too fast it doesn't make sense where everybody's talking about save the environment but here we are hauling balls to hurry up and get back to get the load even if it means empty and i don't think that people really understand how much in charge say the oem or in my world even the used car deal and, they, and that's you know robbie can attest to this it's nothing to go to an auction, grab nine cars, take them where they go, drop them off and come back empty for the customer. So okay. I, it was funny to kind of see that engagement there. I, I, it made me feel good. <laughs> yeah. We're just, not the just, only one. Yeah, just like a truck, the rail wants to uh, run loaded, uh, you know, improve that utilization rather than running empty. And uh, so that's why they can go to, after they unload, they try to get them to the nearest porter plant around that destination there was a there was a question jeff uh one of the guys was asking is it possible for what was it third party it was nick jay he asked about a third party owning a trailer or renting or yeah buying. he did so nick had a question that was one that i i wanted to see if i could get around to um so thank you ty let's see here nick uh yeah he's he's basically asking if a third party can buy a multi-level trailer and and silver mint also was asking do on do any auto retail companies own their own rail cars i think that's kind of the thought yeah and uh we we talked about the shared pool of sixty six thousand, but the uh honda for example owns some of their own rail cars so they don't ship every vehicle uh honda vehicle in one of those rail cars but it's basically at an OEM level. Um, uh, I don't know of any dealers or aftermarket, uh, you know, rental cars or uh, captive finance companies that own any rail cars. Just, uh, just railroads and OEMs. Which actually, you, I'm sorry, you just made me think because there was a question about aggressive marketing. Do if you own rail cars, do you need to do much marketing? I mean, we're here and we own the cars. What else is there? You do you do marketing, but uh, and sales obviously, but account maintenance, uh, making sure that the you know the metrics are met. Um, railroads are hard to do business with unless you're making millions of something, right? So, so the same holds true with with auto racks. And, uh, uh, they know each other, they work together uh, and plan together and negotiate uh, back and forth to provide the best transportation system they can. Um, 
individual movements of anything on the railroad is kind of disruptive and there the um, efficiencies that uh, Hunter Harrison and other uh, other railroads have now adopted uh, are they're looking for less switching more, more volume types of movement so less less one-offs uh, than before it's good well before we get too far i, I know alex is going to have to leave shortly but though i guess one of the big questions jeff and especially robbie uh what are you guys really seeing in real life on boots on the ground on the oem side in the volume is it taking a hit on either one of you yet yeah so i, I mean i can speak a little bit to that you know the volume has been um a little a little sporadic and and unpredictable um you know ranging you know the causes ranging from anything you know from the you know uh the pandemic the coronavirus plants being shut down you know that delayed a lot um so there was that gap and and now we've got this uh um this chip shortage that um that, that's causing a lot of problems worldwide for autos so i think the the turbulence is is going to continue for a little bit until they can get the semiconductor uh, chips, you know, under control. Uh, but that, you know, that is projected to take some time. So, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the, the effects of some of this, uh, you know, worldwide trade issues that are, you know, that are going on and, and manufacturing issues and things like that. Jeff? Um, the railroads aren't so uh, wrapped around one commodity like a uh, car hauler is, right? A car hauler can now haul some freight as well as vehicles, but railroads, if, if one end of, uh, of the business is down, possibly another business, part of the business is up. So I know right now intermodal movements are, are booming. Uh, so the boxes that are uh, on vessels, on rail, on, on trucks, they're moving uh, real well on rail grain also with uh, exports increasing on grain. So uh, that's the, the beauty of the rail. It, it, uh, as one part of the economy dips, another part can lift the railroad, uh, lift their revenue in another area. Wow, that's good. So let's now, say you take, uh, I have a question type for him. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's say you take you know, 50 auto rail cars um, out, out west, let's say. And, uh, you know, out west is, you know, historically one of those places, a little bit more difficult to get back from, you know, for certain things. Now you're taking auto uh, rail cars out. So to come back, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, you know, imagine you're putting grain or anything in that. So to get those, you know, to get that capacity back, right? I mean, I get, you could, you can switch the type of rail car and, and, and move the engines back, but how do you get those 50, you know, in times where, where volumes are really down, how do you get those auto rail cars back? Do you mix them in with other rail cars to, you know, to diminish the impact uh, of, of bringing it back empty? Or how, how do you guys work that? I've always wondered yeah, that. Yeah, the worst case would be running an empty train or a train uh, with no freight on it, right? Just to get yeah. rail cars back to a plant. That happens uh, sometimes from Southern California to Mexico. There's not enough um, yeah. empty rail cars in Mexico. Most of the rail cars are coming full out of Mexico, for example. Yeah, so they Absolutely. need those right. So they need those empties down there uh, to do that, or back to the Midwest uh, to a plant. You know, uh, again, an empty train. Best case scenario would be like unloading at uh, Mira Loma, California and then going over to Long Beach and reloading there, you know, just a few miles away. It might take you a day or two to get there with a rail car, but, uh, and sometimes with a truck, but- uh, you know, Yeah, getting, you ain't kidding. <laughs> and then getting, getting that rail car reloaded at that point and then pointing in another direction. Could be Canada, could be, um, um, you know, East Coast, could be Kansas City, wherever. Sure. Okay. Great. Good. Yeah. The reason I got Alex is Alex is a different gauge. <clears throat> Alex is selling primarily, Alex is primarily selling new, 
new Western Star lures. Is that right, Alex? Yeah. So we we um, we we started as a Cottrell dealer uh, for a very long time since the '90s, and then just uh, recently, uh, last year, end of last year, we decided to switch uh, to lure. So we're selling the, the lure cars. <clears throat> right. So yeah, the reason I say Alex is a good gauge is because every time I talk to Alex, he's slam busy. So I'm always oh, like, are yeah. you kidding me? <laughs> Who's buying trucks right now? I mean, it depends on what you read and who you watch and what you follow. But there are some people saying this might be a little bit of a tricky, turbulent time for the financial sector. And I talked to Alex and he's always selling brand new. What are the 300 grand? Yeah, Maybe? yeah, about give or take, uh, give or take 10 <laughs> either direction. It's uh, oh, 15. You know, <laughs> It's uh, interesting because we, you know, Daimler, Daimler Trucks North America is, is planning to have their busiest year ever next year. So right now we are sold out. Uh, our Freightliners were sold out of Western Stars uh, and we're in April. So uh, this really puts us very com comparable to 2019. Uh, and next year, uh, we're planning to, well, Daimler is planning to produce 15 to 20% more units than the all time high, which was 2019, I think. So they are seeing it very differently. They are seeing demand uh, explode, and, and I think it's going to explode with economical activities. Right now, we're seeing a slump because of, of that, right? We have the ripples of COVID, and we have huge shortage in, in, in semiconductors. But um, even then, the plants are working it out. Like we were supposed to have stoppages of production with Freightliner. And we all braced for a hundred day delay on a lot of our deliveries. And uh, it's not happening. Somehow they're getting the ships somewhere, uh, the microchips somewhere, other parts somewhere. And it's just chaotic. So deliveries are, you know, it's crazy. Some trucks arrive on time, some early, some are delayed. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to plan around that, but they're, they're making it happen. And I just can't imagine at the plants, what they're going through uh, with, uh, with the logistics. So, and it's affecting you guys, right? It's affecting LMR, it's affecting the railroad. So this is, it's probably changes of direction weekly uh, right now, as far as, as far as car deliveries. So, I don't know, I think once they're done with the semiconductors and, and figure out another, you know, kind of replenish the stocks, it's probably gonna be a little crazy Q4 uh, for car car haulers, because there's going to be a lot of cars that they're going to need to move that are already built. All they need is just a few parts, and everybody's going to want them before Christmas. So, Robbie, you're going to be you're going to be slammed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we look forward to trucks. Yeah. Well, it's funny you bring that up because I'd heard that just you know here, but I think I saw that with my own two eyes this week up in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Across the highway from the Clay Como plant, there's this building and a big enclosed chain link fence, kind of a gravel parking lot, full of F-150s that are all pretty dirty, nasty looking like they've been sitting there for a while. So I had heard that they go ahead and complete the, the manufacturing process, minus the chip, I guess, and then they go park them in a field and as soon as the chip comes in, we put it in and go. Is that what you're hearing, anybody? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing that. I'm actually hearing the same thing about uh, Packard, Peterbilt, and and Kenworth. They're basically building trucks without dashes in them and just parking them, so they can you know make an attempt to keep the production line moving. <laughs> That's nice. great to hear that that Daimler's you know getting their hands on some chips, and and yeah. still moving trucks out. Yeah, well, and I think the same is going to happen for the other big you know the other big four uh, truck producers. Um, somehow they have different vendors that come out of the woodwork. Hopefully, hopefully it's reliable stuff. Uh, yeah. But they are building the vehicles, so the vehicles are being built, and and so they're gonna have to be delivered. And so it's gonna be, you know, Freightliner told us uh, that in spite of the hundred day delays, they were still gonna deliver everything they committed to deliver this year. So it just gives you an idea of what the end of the year is gonna look like. Well, and you being in truck sales, you know, I mean, 
we 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 order trucks you know every year annually we 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 you know cycle our fleet uh, a portion of our fleet and uh and you know the orders that we've made are are stretched quite a way out and quite a ways out and it's tough to get uh you know pre-built ready to go trucks um just spec trucks even um mm -hmm. anywhere right now it's very difficult yeah. uh, what's the lead time you guys are looking at alex what you know somebody calls you today and says you know i want a you know 80 foot lore um you know with a with a kenworth what's your what's your what's your lead time or, i'm sorry with a western star yeah would be um uh so my chassis is getting there in September. We'll probably be like uh, mid-September, October, which is not too bad, really. Um, that's pretty good. But it's also because we we preemptively ordered a bunch of Western stars. And so it's it's, al it's almost that it's hard. It's, it's like buying a future on how many trucks you're going to need, right? So you don't want to, you know, you want to have stock for your customers. But if you have a lot of stocks, it means you plan pretty poorly. Because you really want to have everything you, you you're building sold, so yeah. it's really hard to to gauge. Okay, how many trucks? You know, so um, you kind of gauge over prior year and and try to to grow uh, in a smart way. You don't want to be too aggressive and then uh, regret it later because you got a bunch of trucks sitting and getting old. So yeah, it's or if uh, you know if a black swan event happens like you know March of 2020. Then uh, everybody had too many trucks then, so right, right. Uh, until until September and October and then poof the rubber band you know just recoiled and 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 and, and now nobody had nobody has enough trucks so it's not too bad but you gotta you gotta take chances yeah you you gotta take risks and say okay well I'm gonna order fifty trucks I don't know who I'm gonna sell them to yet but uh, yeah yeah fifty times three hundred grand is a lot of money. Well, it's the the lack of new car new truck inventory has got to be driving secondary market inventory. I mean, we're see, certainly seeing that yeah. over here in our area. Right. Yeah, definitely does. Yeah. Um, and, and you see it in conventional trucks too. You see prices that you've never seen before for you know mm -hmm. trucks that are four hundred thousand miles. You know, commanding you know eighty grand. You're like, what? How? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. So it's a good time for use truck market. Um, yeah. Affecting also car holders, although right now it's a little softening because everybody's worried, you know, everyone who does uh, relief work may not see too much work for the next three months coming, right? So that affects used car holders because these are the guys who buy the used stuff. Uh, you yeah. Buy, you know, they buy new stuff, they're like you, Robbie, they, they have contracts. Jeff, were you getting ready to say something a minute ago? Um, no, I was just... Um, you know, it, it is hard to forecast. It's, it's feast or famine, and there, there's unprecedented events that, that, that happen. It's just uh, uh, just hard to gauge uh, how much to, to get. And I, I feel for uh, for both uh, Al and Robbie that you know uh, there's no right answer out there to to uh, you know to to plan with. You have to have make commitments and you have to get commitments right but uh there's so many variables there it's 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 hard to gauge yeah <clears throat> robbie how many trucks are you guys running again we got right at 100 right now oh wow dang how's the driver's situation uh it, it's the same right same. i mean it's it's tough yeah it's tough to get quality drivers and Alex, are, do you see most of your sales for, you know, small fleet or large fleet or owner operators or all? Um, medium size, I would say, medium size fleets. Um, so it's uh, th this. There's a new type for, of trucking companies coming. So there's, there's almost like a new guard of the trucking companies uh, that are coming up where uh, usually there are people who recent, you know, they used to own their own truck and be a one guy, one truck, and then they're growing and they're being, pretty, being smart with their money and then, and then growing and not overspending. And so you see a lot of those companies that are, you know, 10 to 30 trucks that are coming up and it's changing. Right? It's not, uh, 
it's not anymore the old cowboy. Uh, you know, those guys are, are, are retiring. A lot of them are. Uh, so you see more of, uh, you see more immigrants um, that are running their business responsibility responsibly and growing. Uh, that's why I see the trend. And that's why you see trends also changes of type of trucks, right? more automatic trucks as a result, because everywhere else in the world, that's mostly what people drive. Um, so we have to adjust our fleet, um, adjust our leasing companies to a different type of clientele. And then you still have like the big guys, you know, like companies like LMR and, and bigger. There's not that many really. Uh, and so those guys are steady. Um, and it's right now, it's more a matter of being able to get them trucks. So even the guys that are pretty loyal, if they, you know, if they have good drivers, they need trucks for those drivers because they don't know when they're going to see them again. So they need to buy trucks where they can find them or lose the drivers. So there's a lot of that. And this change of hands of contracts, that's where you see big truck orders. Um, you know, someone picks up a ramp somewhere or a contract somewhere. He's usually going to run his own truck. He's not going to get the trucks with the contract. Um, so you'll see jumps, but usually the big companies are better at planning. So you can, you can plan on that a little bit easier uh, and have trucks set aside for them every year because you know they're going to need a certain amount. And then uh, the smaller companies are going to be more like uh, unpredictable. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, hey, Ty. Hey. Yes. I just want to jump in. We got a few questions here. I want to make sure we get to. Travis well, asked. Sorry, hang on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'm going to have to. Alex has to run. I know he does. Oh, he does. Yeah. yeah thank I'm you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but Alex, thank you so much. We'll see you Friday. Okay. Well, guys, it was really awesome. Uh, Really nice to meeting you all. Thank you. It's an honor. First time I'm doing this kind of thing, so I'm, it's awesome. <laughs> so, you did great. Nice Thank you, Alex. Nice. Yes, Alex. Yeah, thanks, thank you Alex. so much. We'll see you yeah. Friday on Cars on the Move. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Show. Thank you, guys. I'm nice, sure. Alex. Yeah, okay, go no, ahead. No, you're right. Thank you for pointing that out, Ty. Yeah. I appreciate you, buddy. I really do. Um, and I, I like what we've got going on here. Oh, we lost Jeff. Nope, Jerry, wait, there's Jeff. Okay, we, we lost Jeff. No, I'm just kidding. Just okay, so here, here we go. <laughs> What's that, Jeff? My battery's at 20%. So All right. We're, we're good what? for a while. Okay, we got, okay, good. So we got a few quite. These are really good. Travis had a really good one, uh, and he's been waiting. And he might, <laughs> hopefully, he's still here. Travis asks When moving cars from the rail yard, the ticket in the window shows a transport fee of about fifteen hundred bucks, but I'm getting paid three hundred to move the car, rail to dealer. Where's the rest of the money going? Right. So uh, well, the, on the Moroni label, yeah, you do have the transportation fee in there, and um, I don't, I don't know that that's an actual fee. It's definitely not a, the the same. It's definitely not for that specific vehicle, uh, but it's an average amount, I believe, of what that OEM is paying for transportation. Um, so if you order a vehicle uh, in LA and get it, and it says uh, 1500 bucks, and if you ordered one in Detroit, you know, uh, uh, just a shuttle away from the dealership, it could say 1500 bucks uh, there as well. So. Um, I don't know that it's an actual amount or that's uh, uh, governed by the, the, you know, the federal, federal government, but uh, I think it's an average. And I would also add to that that, you know, the trucking, the, that, that final leg delivery from the railhead to the dealer in that scenario is not the only leg of transportation. So you're you're accounting for rail, you're accounting for truck away, um, you, you know, maybe you're accounting for shuttles in the yard and, and you know, processing for the yard processors, things like that, too. But yeah, and like, for the parts. Go ahead, Jeff. It could <laughs> even be for the parts for the vehicle, the transport, transportation for the parts inbound to the assembly plant. Yeah. yeah. And you, well, just never, you just never know on that stuff. I, I mean... We, it's not the first time I've heard that question, no doubt. 
Yeah. Well, and you see, you see there are things that happen that you don't really know that's happening. For example, I, I see it up here in Kansas City all the time. Clay Como, the Fords, F-150s. You see people driving them all day long to a big ass parking lot, and jump out and run. <clears throat> Who's paying that? Who's paying that? What is that? Then you see yeah. the big trucks come in there, load them up. Where are they going? Well, follow them down the road. They're going across Kansas City to the railhead and they're unloading them. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, I'm not saying that, you know, more touch points is better, but I am saying 1500 if that's all you've got to work with in transportation, you know, it, there may have been five other guys that touched that thing before you even got to it. It's possible. That's right. Yeah. And if it's coming from, from overseas, you know, you, you can, you can, you can count on it being at least that. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Well, That's if you good consider question. all the logistics companies in between, right. To get yeah. it on the rail, to get it off the rail, the rail itself, the trucking, yeah, it's really that's really interesting. No fun to slice a small pie. But I think just <laughs> right. I don't think that's there. I don't think there's any level of of accuracy that you know in that number. Then you go talk to the dealer. How do you like that price? <laughs> uh, never mind. Kind of brings us back to me and Sue on Thursday. We were talking about how. When a broker asks a carrier not to put the price on the BOL, and right because sometimes those prices can throw off what would otherwise be accurate information. Um, here's an interesting uh, question, Eric Morales: How do brokers book train to ship a car? Well, it's hard to do. Uh, number one, railroads are. I, as I said before, they're hard to work with, especially for smaller amounts of, of vehicles. But um, on websites, the rail websites, you can look and there may be a, a, a way to guide you through to ship vehicles on rail. I know Union Pacific has a sub called Loop Logistics, and you may see that on their, their website uh, and work with Loop Logistics uh, to ship vehicles on rail. You guys, Jeff, you guys in the past have worked with rental car companies before as well, right? Say rental car companies in California moving, you know, 500 vehicles to St. Louis or something like that. Right. Now, rail car, uh, rental car companies are shipping less vehicles on truck and on rail. Uh, yeah. They're uh, retailing them. They're offering uh, one ray, uh, rental into the direction that they uh, want to move the vehicle. So you could fly into Florida right now and grab a vehicle and drive it back for a very cheap price because they want that vehicle out of the Florida market after Easter. So uh, they're getting smarter and shipping less vehicles in total. Transportation to them is a necessary evil, right? Uh, but yeah, absolutely. If they can get around it, they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Robbie, what else you got cooking on your end? Not a lot, busy. man. I know you're busy. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time, too, by the way. That was really nice. I always enjoy having you on. Hey, man, I'm, I'm always Robbie, happy to be on. Yeah, Robbie, I want to thank you as well. It, and it was the contribution, having you here, we knew it would be valuable, so we really appreciate you showing up. Well, I don't know how much value I added, but I, I do oh, appreciate the kind word. He doesn't know. No, he, he doesn't know. Robbie, you are you are a treasure. We appreciate you. Yeah. I wanna I wanna I wanna I got two more here. Um damage claims. Silver Mint was asking about damage claims. What's a what's an average damage claim? Is there a way to on truck or on rail? I'm sorry. This one's to Jeff on rail. Okay. On rail? Well, if the railroad uh, damages a vehicle, usually it's pretty good, like in a derailment or something like that, and the vehicle's salvaged, can't be sold as new because of the massive damage. But sometimes you get uh, um, a vehicle that jumps the chalk or something like that. It's not a, too bad of a damage. Um, I don't know the average number. I would say it's probably north of five hundred dollars uh, something like that just because of you know uh, all the re uh, inflation and repair and, and parts uh, costs and uh, you know uh, 
sensors here and there and cameras now on vehicles. So I mean, it's, it, it's got to be a lot higher, probably higher than 500. But I mean, with technology, they're able to bring that down because it seems like we had heard about a lot of vandalism, but you think that's being still, I mean, there's, isn't there yeah, a certain amount? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's less than, uh, probably less than 0.1% or one out of a thousand with some types of, uh, of damage. And the, the railroads and the trucking companies work to eliminate that, as, as Robbie and I talked earlier. But they do inspections at, at the handoff. So from the plant, uh, vehicles inspected by a shuttle company, it's driven to the, the railhead for loading. Uh, it's inspected again. It's put on the rail, does its rail journey, it's unloaded, it's inspected there, and then the driver inspects it, the dealer inspects it. So somewhere in that chain that the damage occurred, and then there's, you know, that's who ends up playing the, paying the claim. It's a lot of uh, manual inspecting. Right now there's a technology <laughs> guy going, I see an opportunity. All right. And they, they aren't, uh, they're trying to eliminate damages uh, or recording damages that are under a certain amount. But now you have cell phones that can take pictures of damages, scan the, the VIN number. Um, you have a, a good resolution there to, you know, to uh, fight a claim of, or you know, saying that the damage was already there. But bottom line, do your inspection before you move the vehicle. Amen. That was awesome, guys. I'm going to have to jet. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm done. That was good, Robbie. Jeff, it was yeah. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Ty, and, and enjoyed the, the evening, and Robbie as well. Great chat between us. And, and uh, Jay, thank you for having me on, and uh, hopefully we imparted some knowledge. So uh, I really enjoyed it, and uh, it wasn't uh, – I wasn't as nervous as I thought I'd be, right? <laughs> but it was good. Good time. Oh, thank good. you. All right. Well, good. 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 Jeff, this was a great show, and really, thank you so much for staying on. Um, yes, you contributed a lot. I think this is a great episode, and I really appreciate you being here. Huge. Thank you. All right, man. All right. <clears throat> thanks, okay. Jay. And Robbie, Robbie thanks again, guys. man. We will see you again. Yeah, and, and Jeff, maybe there's a future spot on a panel for you. Maybe you'd be interested in that. We'd love to have you back. All right, man. Yeah. Just uh, yeah. get in touch with my agent. Look at get that. Get in touch with my agent and we'll make it happen. Yes. Yeah. Oh. In fact, I'll tell you what. Hey, teaser. Who can help put together a ports show? We got to do that next. I want to do a ports show in the future. Not tomorrow, not next month, but in the future. I want to do a ports show, okay? We can do okay. it. Okay, I'll think about it. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, guys. See you. Okay, guys. Bye. 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 So Bye. Bye. All right, good night, everybody. Thank you. All right, and I'm letting them go, and they're letting me go, too. Guys, um, thank you so much for tuning in for the Tuesday nights, and thank you, Damien, for chiming in. Uh, great comment, and I appreciate everybody sticking around in the live chat. It is 10 o'clock. That means it's time. It is time to shut her down. Um, I certainly want to thank... Uh, I want to thank Murphy Auto Transport Services. Please join us on Thursdays for Dispatching Live. Sue is my co-host. If you need a dispatcher, Murphy Auto Transport Services can hook you up. If you, are, uh, if you haven't checked out DispatchCenter.com yet, check it out. Log in, sign up, load board, TMS, mobile app. This is Superflow Systems. They even have Pro ABD, a CRM. There's even more. Thank you, United Road. Go sign up for Holly, H A U L L Y dot com, Holly dot com. Find loads at Holly. And also uh, learn more about National Vehicle Transporters Alliance, go NVTA.org. I want to thank all my guests tonight, especially the expert consultants in rail car shipping, Jeff Grandstaff, Peter Daly, Lisa Hanmer. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, Lisa, for helping me put this show together. 
getting everybody rounded up. I really appreciate that. And then the second panel with Robbie and Alex and Ty. Thank you all so much for helping me put together 186 on a Tuesday night. New vehicle shipping by rail. Thank you for participating in the live chat. Thank you for ringing the cowbell. BM, thank you so much. That's the goal of Auto Transport Intel, the car shipping business channel, to help share the information. I don't know it all. I don't, clearly. But I want to help locate the experts, bring them in, have a panel discussion, take questions, engage, inform, share, network, and grow. And you're a part of this community. So let me know how I can help. Send me an email, autotransportintel at gmail.com. Tune in to other shows. You saw Alex tonight. He's going to be with us Friday on Cars on the Move. And we've also, we're at DOT Compliance tomorrow at noon. So please join us if you've got an FMCSA, DOT, ELD, IRP, IFTA, Clearinghouse question. Let us know how we can help. Thank you all so much. I'm going to run the car hauler. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe. Good night.